Good morning, everyone. Um, our gospel reading today is Mark 4, 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Those who are participating on the student mission trip, I have three bags down in front and I forgot. I found, with my best friend out in Kearney, we found some road trip bingo. And so these are for you to take on the trip. So we'll make sure those get packed up with you today. Good morning, Faith Westwood. Morning. Blessings to all who are worshiping with us again in person and online. And we welcome all of our special guests who are here today, especially those who are here for the baptism. Now, there are two exciting things I want to share with you today. The first is there's going to be a return of the first Saturday worship. This is going to be held on first Saturdays at 530 in person only, not online at this time. Worship is going to be held in the chapel and those who attend are invited to come through the west entrance. There's going to be a time of prayer, song, scripture and message. And just a reminder that this is going to connect through the summer. This is going to connect with the nine o'clock service and we will also have communion. The second thing is Faith Westwood is doing a new thing for July and August. Under the same sermon series title of I Am, 9 o'clock service will be exploring neglected voices in the Bible, meeting characters who've made an impact on God's story. The 1045 service is going to focus on the I Am sayings of Jesus. Now this is part of the Connecting Hearts Summer, and again, we are trying something new. So just remember, two months, two series and two worship services. And if you happen to want to check out one of those other services, you can definitely do so online. Our current sermon series, though, is Deep Dive. And this is inspired by the Scuba Vacation Bible School. Get it? Deep Dive, Scuba? We are exploring familiar Bible stories, and yet we're having an opportunity to dig deeper into their meaning and how they relate to us today. This weekend, we claim that God is a friend that we can trust as Jesus calms a storm and amazes the disciples. How can we learn to trust Jesus through all of the storms in life? In that spirit, would you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, open our ears that we may hear your word. Open our eyes that we may see your glory in our midst. Open our hearts that we might know your spirit's presence with us in these moments. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, since I preached last on June 2nd, there's a couple of random things that happened that caught my attention. Now, it's depending on what media source you get information from, but Dr. Pepper is now the number two soda, surpassing Pepsi, or maybe tying with Pepsi, behind Coca-Cola. For the record, Pepsi is 131 years young. Coca-Cola is 138 years young, and Dr. Pepper is 139 years young. Wow. Now, I told you that that was random. <laughs> but the firestorm around it has been very amusing, to say the least, as quite a few people have some very strong opinions about this. So just for the record, how many of you are Pepsi fans? How many of you are Coca-Cola fans? And how many of you are with me and Dr. Pepper fans? It's about even in our church. And for the record, I saw this on a reel. If you combine two parts of Coca-Cola and one part root beer, it does not taste like Dr. Pepper, never. <laughs> never, ever, no. 
But speaking of big numbers, we celebrated last week 143 students participated in Vacation Bible School this year. Amazing. Yes. And that number does not even include all of the students and volunteers who helped. So we are so grateful for all who helped with that. Now, it was a privilege for me to serve an elementary Bible story. And Maddox Larison was my uh, partner, and he assisted me in so many ways. We had so much fun bringing stories to life, including today's story. And now, since I last preached, I also found out that Frameless Creative created the largest and the first permanent multi-sensory art experience in London, England. And so check out this video. And we're going to do this without sound, guys. So let's check out this video. This is a Rembrandt Immersive, and it was nominated for a Visual Art Society Award in January 2024 in Outstanding Achievement in Visual Effects. This video shows how they took the painting and they turned it into an immersive experience so you would feel like the waves were coming right to you and that you were, could even be on the boat and experiencing this. Truly, Rembrandt's painting of the storm on the Sea of Galilee is amazing, yet bringing it to life, as you can see, is absolutely positively extraordinary. And if I didn't say, this is in London, England. After first service, people said, I'm heading to London soon. This is what AI and CGI can do. Isn't it amazing? We'll get that video up on our, our site so that you can check that out. But you can see, and, and by the way, this is why you get education in science and in math, right? So they can do cool things like this. Isn't that amazing? Just absolutely, positively amazing. So today, as we enter into the picture of our gospel passage, we experience a, a miracle story with the following elements. Setting that ties into the current and present context for the disciples. There was a problem. There was a solution. There was evidence that the miracle occurred. And then there was a response of wonder. Now, after teaching and preaching the crowds, Jesus invites the disciples to go over to the other side of the lake. It was evening, and the Gospel of Mark writer is clear to indicate in verse 36 that they were leaving the crowd behind. Certainly, there were moments that Jesus and the disciples left the crowds behind. Ministry tasks held that, that combination of exhilarating and exhausting. It's just like vacation Bible school, isn't it? So one of the fastest ways to leave the crowds behind was traveling across the lake, that is, the Sea of Galilee. So while on the boats that were traveling across the sea, there was a furious squall. I was really intrigued by this language, and I wanted to know more about this. This description would indicate an intense rainstorm with strong winds. While squalls typically do not last very long, their intensity would cause fear and distress. Now, such storms were not uncommon on the Sea of Galilee, and with so many of the disciples being fishermen, they knew the risks when they entered that boat that evening. So then the gospel passage describes for us, at that time, what it felt like when the waves were going to overtake the boat that Jesus and his disciples were on. As our children learned in Vacation Bible School, the disciples were beginning to panic. They wanted to know, where was Jesus? And where was Jesus? Sleeping. He was sleeping. Honestly, how could Jesus sleep through a storm on the Sea of Galilee? And why was he sleeping when the boat and its passengers seemed to be facing peril? As the boat was rocking and the waves were increasing, the disciples woke up Jesus and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Of course, what they were saying was something like, how in the world can you sleep at a time like this? 
If you are Lord, can't you do something about this storm? Now here, the disciples were filled with fear and doubt again. Remember that that Jesus was sleeping on the boat because he trusted that the disciples could get him to the other side of the lake. Jesus could sleep because he knew who created the sea and the sky. Of course, Jesus, being Jesus, simply rebuked those winds, which means that he was calling them to stand down. And then he said to the waves, quiet, be still, or other translations say, peace, be still. The winds died down. It was completely calm on those waters. Jesus truly demonstrates his authority when he commands the winds and the waves with simplicity and also with some brevity. And after rebuking the winds and the waves, Jesus showed his disapproval, another definition of rebuke, of those disciples. And he says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And what was the response of the disciples? They weren't trying to make any excuses, were they? They were terrified, the scripture tells us. Because they were still trying to figure out the identity and the authority of Jesus. Now the calming of the storm on the sea was a very important story for the disciples and their journey with Jesus. Again, it's a, it's a miracle story. And for the Gospel of Mark, the storm was very real, and yet that storm is also a metaphor. It was a metaphor for the evil forces and the chaos that was in the world in opposition to the kingdom of God that had been unleashed in the world by Jesus Christ. In the form of a storm, these negative forces were angry and they were threatening. And notice how quickly that storm distracts those disciples from all of the amazing things that just happened. And all of the amazing things that were going to happen in the future with Jesus. Even so, we want to argue that the disciples have every right to be afraid on that boat in that storm. We know that their lives were filled with their own chaos and struggles, mirroring the lives of those in the crowds. But the disciples and the crowds never seemed to quite understand that the Messiah had already arrived. Their search was over, and yet they still couldn't grasp that opportunity to experience all that Jesus brings into their world. Authority over those evil forces, as well as the miracle of bringing peace and calm to the storms in life. They completely failed the trust test, didn't they? I shared with the students during Vacation Bible School that my fear of storms began in March of 1976. I was four years old at the time. My parents were away for the night. Grandma Clara from Plattsmouth was staying with us when the storm started raging in the middle of the night. There were flashes of lightning. There were loud crashes of thunder that woke up myself and my sister, Christy. And then the lights went out. We were terrified. And I remember that in those moments we started from our beds, we started crying out to Grandma. And she spoke to us so calmly. She instructed us that we needed to get into the basement as quickly as possible. She told us, to get out of bed, to crawl toward the hallway, and once there, we crawled down the stairs into the basement. And I remember that we covered ourselves with my dad's clean work clothes. (laughs) And the next morning, we found out that my brother Craig was born in that storm. Anybody who knows my brother Craig, I'll tell you the stories. It's fitting. Now, there are literal storms that you may face, right? And they bring strong winds, they bring heavy rain, they bring damaging hail and even destructive tornadoes. In the Great Plains, disaster relief funds have been most needed this year. And the storms have also hit very close to home, haven't they? And now our neighbors to the east face those threats of extensive flooding from the Missouri River. These literal storms are messy. 
And they often come at the worst times, right? Yet there are also figurative storms that you may face that are also difficult and tragic and they threaten to undo your corner of the world. These are storms like challenging relationships. Sometimes family members, friends, and even neighbors are more difficult to love. They need some extra grace required. Relationships ebb and flow like waters on the sea. Then there are difficult diagnoses. Those debilitating diseases include long COVID, Parkinson's, dementia, mental illness, all of which cause stress and distress in many lives. Cancer diagnoses. That little C word threatens so much, doesn't it? We know so many people whose lives have been affected by cancer. So this is your public service announcement to do your monthly checks, to wear sunscreen, get checked for skin cancer, and yes, that goes for both men and women. And then there are social issues and ills. Poverty, racism, violence, human trafficking, abuse, addiction, so many more. These storms, are, they're hard to face. They're hard to squelch. And yet as individuals and as a church, we always try to do our part. Storms of all forms are going to come your way. It is inevitable. Yet we can acknowledge that people are struggling and people are hurting. And when they are struggling and when they are hurting, they may lash out and they may cry out with words that don't represent their best selves. The hard truth is that some storms in life are just hard. They cause damage. They leave scars. And yet God is a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. God is a friend that we can trust. Anybody remember what the, in VBS what we said? Thanks, God. When facing life's inevitable storms, we absolutely positively need to remember those words from Jesus. Quiet, be still. Peace, be still. I want you to imagine what it looks like to experience that peace, quiet, and still that Jesus can offer. Imagine what it, what it sounds like to experience that peace, quiet, and still that Jesus can offer. And imagine what it feels like to experience that peace, quiet, and still that Jesus can offer. Nebraska author Willa Cather said, There are some things you learn best in calm, and some in storm. As you and I live in a messy world with messy people, there are lessons that you and I can claim in the storms of life if we are willing to take that deep dive. You learn to prepare. You learn to how to best weather each particular storm, no pun intended. Now each storm may have special techniques. Are you battling wind, rain, hail, or all of the above? With each storm that we face, we learn how to better prepare for the next one. You learn to be patient. Watches and warnings often come to us long before we really need them. Yet we have to be patient as we watch and wait for the potential of the storm to come. And then we need to be patient and to wait until that storm passes. And you need to learn to be calm and not to panic. Of course, that is until it is time to panic. Learning to be calm in the midst of storms and chaos in life is a gift. And it's one that must be practiced. But most of all, you learn that God is a friend we can trust. Thanks, God. No matter the kind of storm that you are facing, literal or figurative, God will be there with you. We have also heard that sometimes God calms the storm and sometimes God calms the sailor. At VBS, part of our lesson was to learn how to calm our own storms by naming them. We did this in VBS with ping pong balls. And we had the water, and as the water was moving, we threw our ping pong balls with, with, with naming each and every storm that people might be facing right now. And then... We let the waters calm, and then we got rid of all of those ping pong balls and gave them to God. 
VBS reminded our students and now reminds us, when we feel worried or scared, we can go to Jesus. He is more powerful than the biggest storm. We can trust him to help us. Jesus can calm the storms in our hearts and in our lives. When you and I face so many kinds of storms, and when you and I are tempted to be like those disciples and say, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Remember that it is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the one who brings peace through all the storms of life. So believe and trust. Amen. As part of Connecting Hearts Summer, we're going to engage in some faith family prayer. So in person, with those who are sitting near you and or online with others or silently reflect, ask one another, how might I pray for you this week? And for those who are guests with us, join on in today. So turn to those who are around you and for a few minutes, let's lift up our prayers. We hope that you will uh, continue even after worship if you need to continue to find out from one another and those sitting around you what is happening in their lives to pray for them. We hope that you will continue to do that. Let's, let's pray. Gracious God, we love you. We praise your holy name. Even in the midst of the storms that we face, 
both literal and figurative, God, we need you. We need Jesus' words of peace and quiet to be still. Help us to claim those words today with all that we are facing in our individual lives. And gracious God, all of this we lift up to you in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.